Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so uh, I want to welcome you all uh, to this panel discussion organized by India March for Science in collaboration with Sophia College for License Department of Sophia College for Women. Uh, I will uh, say a few words about uh, March for Science as such, what is that? And uh, then the uh, panel discussion will follow. Uh, so uh, I am Dibya Shankar Dash. I am a research scholar in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. Um, so uh, this uh, so-called India March for Science that actually started in 2017, uh, followed by uh, uh, March for Science in uh, USA. So uh, in 2017, 9th August, uh, almost, uh, I don't know exactly, but about 30-40 uh, cities in uh, India, we had India March for Science, where uh, you know scientists, research scholars, uh, science communicators, teachers, uh, they came on road and they demanded some very simple things, which is that uh, according to our Indian constitution, uh, we should implement uh, uh, the, practi uh, the practicing of scientific temper is actually our right. So that should be implemented. And also the funding in basic science uh, in research uh, that was uh, decreasing each year. So they raised voice for uh, that also, like uh, funding for the fundamental research should uh, increase. And with the time, it, like each year we had March, and uh, each year the number of marches actually increased. So initially it was uh, some big cities in India, then it started to small towns in, in some uh, states, even in small villages they had some, uh, not March maybe, but some kind of activity related to India March for Science. Uh, so with the years that has spread. Uh, in 2020 and 21, we could not have a uh, in-person March for Science, but we didn't stop. We had uh, our online March for Science. We organized some, uh, you know, science competition kind of thing for school students and college students, and we engaged with them, uh, and we continued our uh, cultivation for scientific temper. And again, to the, from 2021 onwards, we are again having our marches uh, in Mumbai along with other cities. Um, so this is kind of a small uh, history of March for Science. And apart from the once in a year March for Science, we try to organize this kind of uh, panel discussion and talks, which used to be very regular, but now because of lack of volunteers, it's kind of very irregular, maybe twice, thrice in a year, but we still try to uh, organize this kind of thing and getting uh, common people in, the, in this kind of colleges. Uh, so today we have decided to uh, have a panel discussion on a very pressing issue now, uh, the new trend of change of syllabus uh, under the name New Education Policy and uh, how it is going to affect uh, our education system in the long run, also in the short run how it's going to affect. So we have a, uh, four, we have four speakers. Uh, they will try to address the, this issue from different aspects, I hope. Uh, but now I would uh, uh, request uh, uh, Professor Shri to uh, come here for, uh, on behalf of Sophia College. Uh, I would request her to say something. Mm -hmm. Ma'am. very good afternoon and uh, thank you for choosing Sophia as a, a platform for having this panel discussion uh, and a very warm welcome to Dr. Professor M.S. Raghunathan, Pro Professor Karen Henoff, Dr. Sudhakar Sunaki, Professor Kamitra Banerjee and Professor S.G. Thanis. Thank you so much for coming over here and initiating or be part of or leading this panel discussion. Being in the field, trying to grappling with NAP, putting the ball rolling for NAP in the first year syllabus of undergraduate as well as the first year syllabus of postgraduate persons, we 
and part of academia we are scared. Because as part of NFA, we have to drastically reduce the syllabus. Drastically reduce almost 50 to 60 percent science syllabus is cut in undergraduate. Similarly, almost 40 to yeah, 35 to 40 percent syllabus is cut in postgraduate. Undergraduate, we can always say, okay, they are going to choose something else, or they will be trained by the industry when they will be given a job. But in postgraduate, most of the time they are stepping into a research field, and if you don't know the basics, where will you land up with your logical thinking or choice of you know the instruments that you need for research? And I, I really don't think enough thought has been put from the academia perspective into this NAP program, being the player and the performer of the research. I wish enough discussion was had. I mean, maybe COVID contributed to it, and it just crept into our field. You know. NEP has to be implemented, these are the NEP. None of us knew well, how are they going to implement NEP. On the other side, resources side, we are not as resourceful as US University, nor our students are. The, the post or the, the, the faculty members or the numbers are getting cut every day. We were a five member department, we are decimated to one. All other as, as, as other people are in contract places. How can you run an engaging co I mean course without any facilities so far? So a lot of questions with this. So I hope there are eminent people over here who might you know highlight what we this discussion will pave way for people to think about this. Thank you so much for coming here once again. And as a token of appreciation uh, from the Sapara College, we would like to give you all a small packet. Uh, Thank you so much. Please accept them. Thank you. Changes being uh, brought in uh, in the context of the you know, educational policy. Of course, uh, as we all agree, the policy needs uh, educational policy needs reviews periodically. But uh, the fear is that the the just the fact that the review is needed has sort of uh, taken somewhat abrupt turns in, uh, in many ways and. Uh, already the trustee uh, raised some concerns. There are also other people who have expressed concerns and uh, so in this uh, context we felt that we, uh, there is a good, re uh, a good reason to have put together uh, views of various experts and uh, generate some thinking about, about it. Uh, of course, uh, this panel discussion in some way is only uh, one bit. I mean, there's a, should, um, I should all recognize that perhaps a lot more needs to be done. And uh, unless uh, things proceed in the right direction, uh, one might wonder what may our uh, next generation will be learning. I mean, it, it, it's probably going to be uh, far removed from what we recognized as truth or uh, human values and so on. So, in the interest of uh, uh, what we cherish, I think it's important that uh, we and also more people come together and uh, uh, have uh, 
same towards our sense of uh, sanity. We have maybe a little bit of more than one word, but uh, the uh, uh, we support so the correct set of ideas. So uh, without spending uh, more time, let me invite uh, the panelists now. We will proceed one by one. So uh, the idea is that uh, each panelist will uh, make a presentation for about 10 to 12 minutes. And uh, after the, uh, all the speakers are finished, we have four speakers online. And uh, we'll have uh, we'll all, uh, the speakers will attend to the chat. And then we'll have uh, more discussion on uh, how we may go about uh, both in the uh, short run as well as in the long run to the extent that we can put our lives together. So with this, uh, I, may, I will, I'd like to invite uh, Professor uh, Karen Nehada for uh, making a presentation. She is uh, she, uh, she has a technological uh, equipped present, uh, presentation, and uh, so we plan to uh, begin begin with that. So, changes that have come in the school uh, syllabus that are coming right now. And uh, I'll just start by giving a brief history of what happened in the last few years on the topic of uh, evolution. So actually it started in, uh, in 2018, we uh, uh, found this report that um, we 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 uh, see this is this is a report that came, uh, which was from uh, the comments made by Satyapal Singh, who was the minister of higher education at the time, and. Uh, you can just see the highlighted part here. He, he said some rather strange things. He said, I have a list of around 10 to 15 great scientists of the world who have said that there is no evidence to prove that the theory of evolution is correct. Uh, adding that even uh, Albert Einstein had agreed this, the theory was unscientific. Uh, he said, Darwin's theory is scientifically wrong. It needs to change in the school and college curriculum. And, and maybe his most alarming statement was, since man is seen on earth, he has always been a man. Nobody, including our ancestors, in written or oral, ever said they saw an ape turning into a human being. Well, you might think this is some kind of a comedy or something. But he later, six months later, that was in, in 2018, now in, in July, he clarified that this is actually not a joke. And uh, he said that the government was working to bring in a new education system. Books now make children see their fathers as useless, he claimed, adding that it was because they say our ancestors are descendants of apes. Well, of course, any uh, biologist knows that that human beings are, of course, apes. Uh, we're all primates. We're all part of the ape family. But um, uh, so, but it's interesting that he uses this this excuse that the uh, a discussion of ape, of evolution is somehow against the traditional. Indian family values. This is a strange way of uh, putting it. So now what's happened in 2023, which we can find out 
unfortunately more easily from some place like Al Jazeera than from our local, uh, some of our local media, is that um, the uh, Darwin's, we, we read that, that uh, by the 21, 22 academic year, Darwin's theory was finally removed from the syllabus for students of class 9 and 10. And by 22-23, the topic of evolution was completely purged from school textbooks. Uh, from school textbooks. So uh, millions of school students will not know who Darwin was or what his theory says unless they opt for biology in class 11 and 12. Uh, now, uh, nature. The journal Nature, the scientific journal Nature, also uh, had, a, had a news piece on this, where uh, they said that Nature had learned that the, uh, the even the periodic table, was, that chapter was also removed, but the, the uh, chapter on evolution won't be taught to under 16 year olds as they start the new year. And now, what we found in the uh, Indian Express, this was on June 12th, there was a, uh, some uh, response to this, was that uh, people in the government were saying, oh, uh, no, you've got the story wrong. So this is a piece, an editorial piece by the, uh, the uh, head of uh, JNU, who is claiming that, uh, first of all, it's interesting, she says, the usual suspects took to social media to declare the death of secularism and scientific temper in India. So it's interesting that she displays the usual suspects, which is usually used for criminals. So I guess people who want to teach and learn about evolution are called as criminals now. Uh, but she, she's, uh, like she's claiming that this was actually a, uh, uh, some kind of misinformation and confusion. Um, and uh, she doesn't explain, though, what was the misinformation, what was the confusion. Uh, she doesn't say what, what was wrong about these uh, media reports in nature. She's complaining about them but not saying what, what was wrong. Actually, there's nothing in the, in the report in Nature that is uh, mistaken. These parts of the uh, class, the whole chapter on evolution in the, in the class 10 textbook was deleted. Uh, it's also interesting that she does put in some, some little comment here about uh, a hint of why she thinks uh, uh, Kind of implying that she does think uh, the, the thing on evolution is not correct the way it's taught in at present. She says no scientific theory is absolute, it can be contested. The latest debates that have questioned Darwin's theory of evolution need also to be part of the curriculum. Well, this is a statement that you know it comes from all these uh, uh, debates in the US where people have uh, Try to, to claim that there are there are other theories that are that are just as good as the theory of evolution, which is first of all, it's rather strange to call evolution as a theory. It's more of really an observation of, of uh, you know how how um, life on Earth has changed over the years. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of strange that um, she's saying that uh, other uh, theories should be taught also because it's been, it's been very well shown in the U.S. that the people who are complaining about evolution really don't have another, another theory to reproduce it with. There, there, there is no other theory with evidence backing it up, which is uh, explaining how life But still, people in the in the government have have uh, said there, there actually were no changes 
uh, and this is a report from NDTV, that uh, the Union Minister for Education and Skill Development has clarified that there have been no changes regarding the alleged removal, removal of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution from the 10th grade textbook. Now, this is factually wrong. Uh, actually, this, this title that they've put on the piece is maybe not exactly what he said even. This is a quote of exactly what he said. He said, there is a current controversy claiming Darwin's theory of evolution has been removed from the science books. I would like to publicly state that nothing of this kind has happened. So here it's a little more vague. Because actually, the entire theory of evolution had been removed from the textbooks. What the reports were was, was that the, the, uh, the entire uh, mention of evolution has been removed from the class 10 textbook. And this is, in fact, what, what happened. This is the uh, chapter 9, the, the list of topics in, in chapter 9 of the NCRT textbook, which was first put out in 2006. So the first part of the chapter is on heredity. The, the, uh, the second part, in, which is most of the chapter actually, is on uh, evolution. And this, this is the entire part that was deleted. So only the part on um, genetics, Mendel genetics was uh, continued. Not only that, but if you search through the, uh, the, the NCRD textbooks, for any mention throughout any of the school textbooks uh, before class 10, where has evolution been mentioned? You'll find it is mentioned in class 9 also, in this chapter, Diversity in Living Organisms. And uh, these are the, this is the entire text of the chapter in which it's mentioned. Uh, there's one sentence in the beginning where it says, this bewildering variety of life around us has evolved on Earth over millions of years. And then there's a section 7.2 on classification and evolution. Most of this section is just on uh, classification of different forms of life going through the different uh, you know, the, the classification system. But the part on evolution is simply this. It, it's simply a, this definition of evolution. What is evolution? Most life forms that we see today have arisen by an accumulation of changes in body design that allow the organism possessing them to survive better. Charles Darwin first described this idea of evolution in 1859 in his book The Origin of Species. And then it has one more chapter, one more paragraph. Now, actually, there are problems with the way this is framed, but the, the problem is not that it's mentioning the problem is it's, it's not doing it quite correctly, which maybe I'll mention that at the end. But it, in any case, what happened was this, uh, this entire chapter was, was also deleted from the syllabus. And there's one more place uh, where evolution, the word evolved comes. He, he only mentioned in this chapter on why do we fall ill, which is kind of strange that you have a chapter about illness and microbes uh, and no talk about evolution. The only mention was this sentence, different species of microbes seem to have evolved to home in on different parts of the body. Well, this chapter was also removed. So it is true that now, in fact, uh, uh, there is absolutely no mention of evolution in uh, school up to uh, Class 12. In class 12, there's a chapter on evolution. So what is happening now it, with the uh, national education policy? Well, uh, as you might know, they are reframing a number of things. And many of the changes seem to be to kind of make things more like the, uh, the system of education in the USA. So the, the, uh, the kind of the, 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 the instead of having uh, the, the traditional boundaries between what was called primary and uh, 
secondary school and college. Uh, now, this has been redefined as there's a middle stage, which comprises class six to eight, and then there's a secondary stage, which is what is, is usually called high school in the US, or that's classes nine through 12. So in classes six to eight, uh, I was looking through to see if there's any any mention of evolution at all. And I saw this one uh, description. Uh, it says in section C3.1, describes the diversity of living things observed in the national surroundings. But um, I was hoping that maybe this has something to do with evolution, but it seems like probably it's just another, uh, the usual kind of rote memorization is going to be done for, for knowing the names of, of different kinds of plants and animals and how to categorize them. Now, there is one other section which I, I thought might be involving evolution. It says, describes biological growth changes. It describes biological changes. But here, what they mean by changes is simply development. This is in uh, adolescence and uh, emotional development and so on. So it seems like for the middle school up to class eight, there's no talk about uh, evolution. And uh, yeah, also it's interesting that they, they're talking about integrating physics, chemistry, and biology, but each of these is still discussed separately. So it's the same old story of they're talking about integrating science, but all it means is having different chapters in one book instead of having three different books. Now, if you look through the NEP document itself, you'll find uh, the word evolve does come in many places, and even the word evolution, but usually, or always, what, what they're talking about is actually not biological revolution, evolution, but the evolution of learning and knowledge and um, so, as far as I can make out, there's no mention of evolution up to class eight. Now, for the secondary stage, it doesn't uh, it doesn't really clarify which things are in which class. This is for classes nine to twelve. So it does say this uh, C three point three says describes mechanisms of heredity in terms of DNA and genes chromosomes and variation as changes in the sequence of DNA. So this sounds very much like what the, chap the uh, class 10 chapter is after the evolution part has been removed. So it sounds like what, what may happen is that uh, evolution will not be there in class 9 and 10 and uh, maybe it still will remain in class 12 because you have section uh, C 4.5 says analyses evidences of biological evolution demonstrating the consequences of the process of natural selection in terms of changes in LL frequency and population structure and functions of organisms. So this this sounds like evolution, but it doesn't say which class it will be in. So most probably it would just be there in class 12, as it was announced before. And this is what the, the old class 12 chapter on evolution looked like. It actually was very detailed and uh, uh, actually quite problematic. So the problem is with having evolution only there in class 12 is that, uh, of course, uh, according to this statistic, it's a little old, but at this time, 74% of the population, 18 years and above, dropped out of school before reaching class 12. So, of course, they would never have had a chance to learn anything about evolution. This continues in the new uh, policy. And then, of course, the other thing is that most students in class 11 and 12 uh, do not opt for science in the past. And it seems like this is still going to be uh, carried forth according to the NEP. Uh, 
there will still be options whereby still after class, in fact, it might be instead of after class 10, it might be after class um, 8. Starting with class 9, students may not be required to have science at all. Uh, I don't know what's written in any of this, it's not very clear, but it seems like this is probably what's going to happen. There's going to be more uh, division between different students, and uh, maybe the poorer students, or maybe according to class and caste, and where you're living, students, uh, disadvantaged students will not even have a chance to continue learning science after class eight. They will be herded into a uh, vocational stream or maybe some kind of arts or commerce stream as before. Yeah, yeah, I'm just wrapping up. So uh, what I wanted to, uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about this, but if you want to find out more about what is the, the problem with the way evolution has been taught in the past, uh, there are these two papers you could look up. And you can find these simply by searching for my name and the words problems teaching evolution. So I'm not going to go through this, but these are the uh, reasons what, what I've put in these papers of why it's important to study evolution. And uh, these are the uh, problems with the, with the uh, way that evolution has been presented in the textbooks. So I just like to end by saying that um, these uh, actually these activities and concepts related to evolution should be uh, should be revised, but they shouldn't be deleted. They should be they need improvement. They should be embedded throughout chapters throughout school. So I'll stop here. Are there any questions or we can, we can wait until the end of the day? Thank you, Professor Karen Hedda. Uh, let me next invite uh, Professor Kement Raghunathan. Maybe no? Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, the government has started implementing the various recommendations of the NEP, New Education Policy. The NEP document is by and large owned by the new bodies. But there are a few issues where it has come up with new purchases. And unfortunately, these are because terrible in fact. Changes, the suggestions for changes, which are, to put it mildly, the first. Then, in fact, the, the, I think the policy advocated by this commission is basically terrible. It's wrong in many ways.
school education, especially the science disciplines. I think the case of uh, humanities is much worse. They have really done terrible things for humanities. By the way, I don't know which one should place the blame entirely on the Education Commission, but I think they do bear the blame because it is part by them that over makes the new changes in the curriculum and come up with their ideas. It's unfortunate that uh, there, are, there are scientists on that uh, commission who have uh, who must be held responsible for the kind of things when it's in the curriculum of the schools or for the matter, and there are college levels which can be a two-way The In fact, I, I know that there are two scientists, the chairman, Kasturi Randa, and uh, Mathematician Anjul Barwa, who is presented as a mathematician, is superb, but it's the document they have produced, if the curriculum the changes suggested are possible to them, but they have the policy document, it doesn't speak to whether they are. I can't say it speaks Now, one of the things, I mean, I have no feeling deep on the what kind of changes. It is not good. We should hold it. Hold it close. Go and so. I thought if it works, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. Well, uh, about the kind of directives given to schools about the syllabus, about the uh, change the curricular, I, I cannot say much. It's much already a lot has been said, but I am not very familiar with the various changes. I'm a little more familiar with what has been suggested at the undergraduate level. I don't know how, uh, if the suggestion comes from the UGC, is it something which is mandatory for everyone to, to, to go by? I mean, of course, they can cut points. That is the that will be way they can control things. But in principle, universities are supposed to be autonomous. And curriculum is not something with which some other agency should interfere. Each university should have its own curriculum. In fact, these days, the talk of autonomous colleges, this is a Sophia one? Yes, we are in Okay. This is an autonomous college. Each college should have its own curriculum. I don't see why the central authority should dictate what the curriculum should be. That would work for diversity and, you know, each university or college will develop in its own way. And so sometimes it's get uniformized because of societal pressure. I mean, after all, your students, how they do well in, uh, in later life is what to control the way you want to train them later. You want, you want to make changes. And the curriculum is one of those things which will change with time. You see, you have all the universities and colleges competing to see whose students are going to do well in life and so on. And from that, some kind of changes will automatically take place in curriculum. That's the way it should change not by some central authority dictating what they should do. And it's not clear that the central authority is always going to be right. We have a bunch of morons sitting on the, as a, as a central authority, as a central authority. So it's not clear that uh, what they prescribe is the right thing for the universities. What we need is diversity and evolution. Each institution evolving in its own way. That's the, like the right thing to do. I don't know the way things are going we are trying to get everything more and more centralized in the circle, which is terrible. Of course, there's always been a set tendency to centralize still from the very old days. I mean, back in the days, uh, education became, for instance, a concurrent subject which would be a state subject. So, the tendency has been there, but the present dispensation seems to go at it with great vigor and with, what should I say, with uh, maniacal energy. Now, one of the things in the undergraduate syllabus that I have come across, because uh, I work in this institute called the Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences, which received a subject from the Department of Atomic Energy, which says that you have a course on uh, Indian knowledge systems, whatever that means. Now, uh, the knowledge is something which is, there is no particular system of knowledge which is uh, superior to any other. Right? All over the world, people are pursuing knowledge in different ways. And what is what do they mean by Indian knowledge system? If they mean 
So you just pick up all the great things done by our past scientists or mathematicians and put that together and keep that. That doesn't really make sense because what the, what what is the purpose? If you are trying to say it, like, well, it may of course make you take pride in our past achievements, yes, but I don't think we need that anymore. We have enough pride about our, about our past achievements that we don't, we don't have to go through it all over again. In fact, uh, you know, Brett Noir of the present uh, dispensation, Jawaharlal Nehru's history of India, has a chapter on Indian mathematics. If you want to summarize the achievements of Indian mathematics in two pages, you can't go to a better source. Meant to print for briefly. The history of India is just two page account, it's a chapter on mathematics in India. So, it goes, it goes back to the history of India. Since independence, we have been told over and over again many things about our about our past achievements, and I think there is enough pride about our past achievements among our people that you don't need this new introduction of whole course of course for undergraduates talking about achievements in science. Indian knowledge system is what it's called. Of course, the very moment in the periodic table and data theory and evolution system in 12 standard textbooks of the NCRC has grabbed the media attention. If this is indeed done as per the recommendation of the Education Commission, it speaks poorly of the Commission. And I'm really disappointed that, you know, there is this person who is called, called uh, Chairman of the Advisory Committee to the Cabinet for Science uh, on Science. Doesn't he want to say something about this issue? I can't understand. This is an issue which affects all science students. And I'm surprised that the advisor seems to acquiesce in whatever this view they see. I'm also disappointed that the academic, science academies in this country have not said a, a word about these issues. It's an important issue and it's a, the future of our students in science, to say nothing of the humanities, is at stake. And nevertheless, our scientific academies have not made any statements on this issue. That's very important. Well, let me know specifically to mathematics. Uh, one of the things that was then uh, recommended by the UGC and has been taken up weekly by many universities already is to have a, a course on basic mathematics. Well, my colleague Dani is here who is an expert on you know, the subject, but basic mathematics as far as I can see is not really serious mathematics. It's at best recreational mathematics. It could be something like what you do Sudoku problems. It is, uh, that, that's the kind of mathematics it is. It's not serious mathematics at all. And uh, uh, I suppose some, some of you may know this, but it is written by Sankara Charya of uh, Kuri, a man by name Bharti uh, Krishna or something something. Bharti Krishna Tita. Yes. He was the Sankara Chanaya of the Puri Mat uh, some years ago in the middle of the last century during the period. And he wrote this book in 1955 and quotes Kaj Mura Sutras. Since our general public is not very really conversant with Sanskrit, that is only when it was Sanskrit Sutras, it was everything. And on top of that, of course, he claims it all comes from Vedic literature. It is not substantiated at all. Anyway, I expect. Professor Dani will make further comments on that and his this topic has comments on that. And then, <coughs> and then what do they expect to teach in the so-called knowledge system, Indian knowledge system? What do they want to teach? Do they actually take pieces of mathematics or science from various uh, works of our ancient uh, scholars? Is that what they are trying to do? Then what's the point? How does it in any way advance your knowledge of science? We are inheritors of every tradition everywhere in the world. There's no, there's no point in sticking to our science. There's no such thing. Science is not uh, divided into Indian science and Chinese science and so on. It's one whole thing. And every, every civilization has contributed to it. 
and there are affiliates with one civilization who contributed more than others, and there are other affiliates and others have done that. Our own contributions to, well, we simply at their peak in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh centuries, and after a break again in the 14th century when calculus was invented by the so called Kerala school. But there are periods when there are such peaks, other times they just fall back on whatever earlier knowledge had, and we do not advance knowledge at all. So, what does it mean to this of the Indian system? And uh, I don't know, I think it's, it's, I, I've heard that uh, we made spectacular advances in medicine and uh, in astronomy, which has always been uh, mixed up with mathematics, and then in chemistry, perhaps, in metallurgy, perhaps. But I don't know if we have made any great uh, achievements in physics, to my knowledge. I have not heard of it, but my, my knowledge may not be very, very good at this. And what about other areas? When you say knowledge system, what about economics, politics, and so on? And I don't know if you are supposed to teach something from Arthashastra, maybe something from Bharata Sati Shastra, I don't know what, what else. Maybe Vachana Kama Sutra, what are the systems of knowledge you are going to teach? Not clear. Thankfully, of course, they have left it open, I guess. From the sector I saw, it wasn't clear that they specified any particular books. Uh, but the point is that uh, if you ultimately uh, teach something, uh, and I'm sure somebody will, will, will get very angry to you know, teach something from Kama Sutra. And that, that will happen in this country. Now, anyway, and so it's not clear what it means. But um, basic mathematics we even introduced as a uh, some certificate course in some universities is what I find. It is, I think it's a very retrograde step and it's only going to spell disaster for our future students. I do hope that things will prevail and soon enough all this will be changed again. Thank you. That's all I really want. I'll, I'll speak from here, if it's okay for all of you. Uh, I am Dr. Sudhakar. I am a medical graduate. Uh, first uh, honorable member. My apologies for coming late. I'm very sorry. Uh, I'd like to talk about medicine and Indian medical system, whatever I know, my experience, and how it's related to new education policy. See, in uh, March 2020, uh, when we were about to be you know, about to start the epidemic of COVID, there was a big uh, you know, announcement or a big a message from a uh, famous politician from India uh, saying that uh, cow dung, cow dung and uh, cow urine will prevent uh, corona. Fine, this is available on the net, anybody can see. And uh, this first part, and followed by one member of parliament from Assam, she said that, uh, oh, that what is wrong in cow dung? When you apply cow dung because of the smell, the virus will disappear, they will be destroyed, there will be corona. That's followed by, in Gujarat, another famous institution, they started the uh, cow dung therapy. Uh, they called people on payment, and uh, They'll be, uh, they'll apply cow dung on the entire body, and everybody, videos are being taken, they are available on the, on the YouTube. And with cow urine, uh, they'll be given bathing, and they'll say that now we will not have uh, corona. Now, uh, this is one example, it's a live example. The fact is, we have lost uh, almost 5 lakhs people as the government data due to COVID-19. But some of the famous international experts on biostatistics, international institutions, they say the data is not very correct. We must have lost more than 10 times of what the data shows. 
we have some India, we, we love our government to respect our government data. But this is a, another fact. Okay? Now, we heard about new education policy 2020. New education policy says there should be scientific temper. That is the, one of the basic principles of new education policy. So what is the science what is the scientific temper in cow dung? Application of cow dung, what are the changes that have brought into the body? Clinical science, what changes have brought into the system like respiratory system where people were requiring oxygen because of lack of, lack of oxygen, several people lost their lives. What happened to the level of tissue? What happened to the level of cell, molecule? Is there a is there is is there a scientific evidence? That these sort of practices, if pronounced by a famous politician, what will be the impact on rural populace? More than 70% of our population live in rural areas, even in urban slums. What will happen to them? So, where is the scientific temper of new education policy in this sort of issue? This is the first phase. And second phase is similar to that. Uh, the latest uh, NEET, NEET DG, Postgraduate Entrance Exam for Entry into MD, MS, MCH, DM card, etc. Uh, government announced even if you get zero marks, you will be eligible for getting admission into MD and MS. In the NEET Entrance Exam, even if you get zero marks, still you are eligible. And they have got admission, they are admitted now. It's clear. Now we have around 350, I'm talking about MBBS, allopathy system. We have around 350 government medical colleges, another 350 private medical colleges. So most of the post-surgery branches in medicine, which are in demand are MD general medicine, general surgery, orthopedics, ophthalmology, radiology, radiology, radio diagnosis, radiotherapy, radi radiology is the highest, highest demand. Now, all of the government medical colleges, Radiology, MD radiology branch is filled up. They are filled up by people with higher medics, higher competency. But private medical colleges, all these clinical branches, we call them clinical branches, which are in demand, they are not filled up. Because the need PG entrant aspirants, they could not get the minimum benchmark to get admission into that. So how is the seat will be filled up? Okay. What the government decided, government decided that even if you get zero marks, you can get admission. So zero marks in need PG entrance, and most of these clinical sciences, post graduation, which are in high demand in private medical colleges, which were not filled, they are filled up. Clear, sir. And the fee ranges from minimum 20 lakhs per year to 80 lakhs per year. Three years is the course. Now, national. Now, new uh, national education policy 2020, another concept is higher education will be available to all the, all the categories of the society, rich, poor, and the competency and merit will be given, a lot of importance. So, if you are a poor man, poor postgraduate aspirant, you have got higher merit, you could not get admission into government medical college in postgraduate but you can't pay the money. So you can't get admission into the private medical college of your choice. But I have got zero marks. I have got money. I also appeared to the post graduate but I can get admission. Clear? And the national education policy also says competency, com more competent people will enter into higher education. So how can you say that competent people have entered into medical education with zero marks? Clear? Am I clear, sir, what I'm trying to say? The second case and third case. <clears throat> I think last two weeks ago, Supreme Court has given a uh, oral warning to uh, Ramdev Baba, who has propounded yoga and other things. Many people like it, many home, early morning people practice yoga, they're very happy. Good. Then he warned, Supreme Court warned that Patanjali uh, warned that you cannot. Uh, give advertisement that you can cure blood pressure, you can cure diabetes. If you give an advertisement, you will be, for every advertisement, you will be, will be find one crore. Okay, it is available on the next Supreme Court. 
day before yesterday, day before yesterday, the same Ramdev Baba used to teach advertisement saying that we have got one crore patients who have been cured of diabetes, hypertension, cancer. We have got clinical evidence. We have got research data. You know. So the message I'm trying to say is, if you if we have these sort of uh, <coughs> sorry. If you have these sort of policies, if you have these sort of pronouncements, and in the name of uh, uh, Indian knowledge system, everybody likes their own country's knowledge system. I also like my own country's knowledge system, but there has to be a benchmark. There has to be uh, a research data. The research, if you are an Ayurvedic system of medicine expert, you, you need not be evaluated by me. I am from Ayurvedic system. But you have to be evaluated by your own system of experts which has to be based on evidence, there has to be a data. Okay, so this is one thing. So on that basis, I would like to say, I would like to say three things only before I conclude my session. In new education policy, uh, if you want to have a good, you know, very competent and very, very high quality education, uh, there should be, first of all, there should be teachers, if you look at higher education institutions in India, as per 2022 data, Central University, Indian Institute of Management, and Indian Institute of Technology, 30 to 46 percent of the teachers' posts are vacant. Then how will you have very good quality of education? If you look at primary education, primary education, first to fifth standard, you got more than 20 to 25 percent of the schools from first to fifth standard, where we have only one teacher for from first standard to fifth standard. So what would be the quality of education there? And more than 30 to 40 percent of the teachers positions in the entire country in primary education are vacant. What would be the quality of education? So what new education policy we are uh, you know, implementing? Okay, this is one part. The second part is cutting across all the issues, even if you anything you teach in primary education, from primary education onward, there are three things which I can all interrelated. One is every issue, every child has to have a critical understanding of an issue. It has to be taught to children. Two, there has to be a logical analysis of the issue and there should be scientific temper. Children should be taught about fearlessness. You should ask questions to the powers that be. You can ask questions to your class teacher, your class, to your headmaster, or a principal, university vice chancellor, with due respect and honor. But if you ask questions now, I can be uh, put into jail, or I can be, there can be some cases on me, or anybody. We can't ask questions. That is the environment uh, here as of today. So uh, that's all I wanted to say. And uh, thank you. And sorry once again for coming late. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shandaki. Uh, our final, uh, last panelist is uh, Professor Somitra Banerjee, and I invite him to. So, should I speak from there or here? This is better. Better? Good. Uh, today, we have assembled here to take stock of a very important thing. The most important thing in any nation's life is how we impart education on the next generation. Whether we are educationists or not, everybody should be concerned about that because it concerns the next generation. And you will find that after the uh, implementation of the new education policy has started, a pattern is emerging. That pattern was not immediately clear when we read that 66 page document. It was not immediately clear. Because there is a lot of rambling about various things, but when it can be implemented, we are seeing a pattern. Medical colleges. Now, courses on astrology is being introduced. Engineering colleges and architecture. 
courses on Vastu is being introduced. All colleges across the board, courses on uh, Indian knowledge systems being introduced. Vedic mathematics is being introduced. See, the, 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 there is a whole pattern in it. It is not that things are happening piecemeal here and there. The whole thing is tied by a string. Essential element is that unscientific ideas that have been that you know are matters of the past, humanity has come forward. Those are being introduced as curriculum, as something to be taught to the next generation. This is a very big thing. Because the students who are now learning, they do not yet have the ability to judge whether, whether what they are learning is correct or not. Most students learn because the teachers teach them. Most students take them as fact or truth because that is what is written in the textbook. Now this is what is being introduced now. Imagine a doctor 10 years later. You go to a doctor, today he might do some analysis and then he might say or she might say that you have got this ailment. 10 years later the doctor may say, no, no, you are, you are ailing because your Saturn is in that position. See, this is the possibility we are looking at. You go to a go to a uh, architect to get your house built. The architect will look at the space available and how you can make the best utilization of the space so that as per the requirement of that particular person, this is how architecture is done. So that it aesthetically pleasing, it's good to be in that particular house. But now they will also consider from which direction the Atma will come in and which direction the Atma will go out. See, this is how things are taking shape. There is a whole chapter in the new education policy regarding the importance of Sanskrit. Sanskrit has done its great service in Indian society because it was at one point of time the link language. The language of communication of ideas. Yes. But now, they are saying that the knowledge that is available in Sanskrit that will be taught to the students now. Now let's give an example. In India, there has been great development in mathematics and astronomy. It is true and we are proud of that. For example, Brahma Gupta, Bhaskaracharya, they did enormous amount of work. We are proud of that. But now, if uh, Spherical astronomy is taught from Bhaskar Kariya's book, Gulathaya, from that book, or say, uh, trigonometry is taught from Brahmagupta. Is that welcome? I am requested to think. They did great work. Think in this line. Do we teach classical mechanics from Principia Mathematica of Newton? We don't. Why don't we? Because classical mechanics has not stopped after Newton. It has advanced. Other people have added to it. And finally, what is available in today's textbook takes into account what Newton contributed, but also takes into account what others contributed. Finally, the, the, the advanced form of knowledge that is available, that is given to our students. Now, if you now say that no, the present status of trigonometry will not be taught, rather what was there in Brahmagupta that will be taught. Will they really learn? They will not. Because these books, when Bhaskaracharya wrote, for example, there is a book called Nilavati. At one point of time, in fact, uh, 150 years back, that was a textbook. And that did not remain a textbook because Ishwar Chandra Vita Sagar says that no, this is not the right material to be taught. Because mathematics has advanced. And this book was not written with the students in mind, it's not a textbook. And therefore, he, is, he prevailed and ultimately that was no longer taught. And now these are being brought back into your culture. 
I am not demeaning the importance or the contribution of Bhaskarari or Arjun Mukherjee. I am really respectful about them, but it is not the way education should be taught. So the, there is a whole uh, uh, pattern in the whole thing. But I have heard this particular argument from some educationists. Educationists who sort of support the new education policy, they say, that mankind have found so many things, so many things are now known. Can you teach everything to school students? No, you cannot. And therefore, if we now drop theory of evolution or uh, uh, Mendeleev, what is wrong? We cannot teach everything anyway. The point is, what should be taught in school up to 10? What should be taught in class 2? What should be taught in college? What should be taught in master's level? There should be a policy for that. It's not somebody's choice, somebody's uh, you know, whimsical idea. It should be a policy for that. What is the policy? Worldwide acceptance. That the school is where everybody, irrespective of whether they go to higher education or not, everybody gets their basic education. And therefore, whatever the society wants the next generation to, to know, so that they can become uh, possible contributors to the social development, that means they are, they are in a position to, to play a meaningful role in society, that much must be taught. Not everybody goes to the class 2 level, yes, then the further development, further you know, specialization that can go into the class two, then the college, then further specialization, the master's level. So you go into further specializations as you go up the educational ladder. But a student who is going out of school, irrespective of whether he or she goes into college or not, that person must be equipped enough so that the person uh, has the trust of what mankind has learned about how nature and society function. Now, at one point of time we believe that everything is as they are. The cow has always been as they are, as they are. the horse has always been out They were created like that. That idea was shattered through the development of the theory of evolution. Now we understand everything is there. Everything is, is Ordering all the time. There is nothing static, nothing unchanging. Now, this is a mindset. You have to understand that science has given this idea that everything changes. And the start of that idea was in Darwin in theory of evolution. When theory of evolution was proposed, we did not know the stars before. But since the idea came that so far we thought that these things do not evolve, but we know that they, they do evolve. What about the things that we still we do not understand as evolving? The stars. Then we looked at them and found that they are not evolving. So the whole idea is that this idea. Now, a student who has gone through school and into college, or they have gone through school and into their profession, that person may or may not remain all the details of evolution theory. Not necessarily. But he or she will retain at least this much that everything changes. Everything evolves. Even though I may not know, I have forgotten, but there is a theory, the knowledge is existing. That is important. Uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky, an eminent biologist, says that nothing in nature, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And if you rephrase the question, you can also say, nothing in chemistry makes sense except in the light of the periodic table. So what has been dropped? What has been dropped is exactly the things without which nothing will make sense. So there will be books, nothing will make sense. How will the students learn? By memorizing that is what it is.
This is a wrong way of imparting it. What I am trying to say is that this pattern, the pattern that is that is visible when the new education policy is being implemented, this pattern is becoming visible. The pattern is that the conceptual clarity will now be sacrificed. Students will not develop a conceptual clarity about the things that they are learning. And then by that, they will not be able to develop what is known as scientific temper. Scientific temper is essentially how science functions, how science teaches you to think, you apply that to day to day life, that is scientific temper. Right? So if you do not understand how science works, how science functions, then obviously you will not be able to apply to day to day life. There will be no scientific temper. Scientific temper becomes the first sacrificial goal. Second is, these are things that are going out. What is coming in are exactly the things that go against scientific temper. They have not clarified, they have not clarified exactly what should be taught in the courses on Indian knowledge system. If you go through the six page, six page document, they have said that Indian knowledge system is the what should I say? Uh, there is a language I forgot forgetting the language. It is basically the whole policy is based on that. They are saying right in the introduction. But in the whole document, they have not clarified what is the Indian knowledge system. Then how do you understand? The people who are proposing it, what have they expressed? What have they said? For example, uh, one uh, chief minister of a state, I'm not naming, you might know, uh, he said that in the days of Mahabharata, there was internet and television. Why? Because how else could Sanjaya give, give a running commentary of the Mahabharata war? And therefore, Indian knowledge system implies the existence of internet and television. And then uh, the last uh, mission, the last uh, the education minister, huh? he in the parliament itself, he said that lakhos al pehle. I am quoting his language. Lakho saal pehle, Rishi Kanad ne Paramanu Pariksha Kiti. Which means that Rishi Kanad did a, a nucleus test. Aaj kya kar rahe ho bhai? Rishi Kanad Lakho saal pehle. Now let us give a brief idea about the timeline. Modern humans evolved around that time. And most of the period of modern humans was, you know, uh, Paleolithic and Neolithic Stone Age. And agriculture started some 10,000 years back. And therefore, you are now talking about a time when Kanat to perform the, the uh, nuclear test as something when it was basically hunting together in society. So, the point is that these are the things, even the Prime Minister said that we had the ability to implant an elephant head on a human torso because we have this gun. Now, these things, see, if you are just anybody, I would ignore, I would laugh it off. But when you see that you are, you are, you are the, for the person or the dispensation that is forming education policy, then the danger is those who want to please you, listen to this case, those who want to please you would incorporate these in the classroom. And this is exactly what happened. I could have ignored, I could have ignored this, but this is exactly what is happening now. Right on ground. Right on ground. 
IIT Kharagpur now has a center for excellence on engineering knowledge. A center is supposed to do research. A center is supposed to train courses. They are only publishing their research results in calendars. Every year they bring out a calendar in which they, they, they publish their research results. And you look at this calendar. It's a marvel. It's a marvel of unscientific text. To give, a, give a, a few gems from the marvel, you see in the Harappan uh, seal, there is a picture of one imaginary animal with one horn. Right? Uh, sometimes it's called unicorn or something like that, but it's an imaginary animal. The calendar says, no. It is Eka Shinda Rishi. So it, it, it is actually a Rishi. They are claiming that the Harappan period, the Indus Valley civilization, is part of the Vedic age. Why? Because you see the, the swastika symbol there. A swastika symbol is something that is also used by the Nazis and swastika symbol is also used by the Aztecs in South America. So it is, it is, it is everywhere. You do not have to be Vedic or Indus Valley in order to have the swastika symbol. It is everywhere. Practically every civilization has that particular symbol. So point is that they are trying to do these propagate these and putting that into the curriculum. Now this is coming into the curriculum. That India is a Vishwa Guru. All knowledge that we have all over the world has flowed out from India into the rest of the world. We should not talk of Euler. We should not talk of Newton. We should not talk about Einstein. We should not talk of Darwin. Everything has flowed out. So they are trying to give a perspective where this is the Indian knowledge system, the crux, that all knowledge has flown out from India into the rest of the world. Even though I am very proud of our past, that India did contribute a lot to the storehouse of Hindi human knowledge, but still I would say that's not fair. At one point in time we did, but there was also a downfall of Indian science at some point of time. And there was a dark age in Europe, there, there was a dark age in India. There was a renaissance in Europe, much later there was a renaissance in India. So we have to take that into account. Therefore, we have to actually take into account the actual history of science, which is now being distorted. So it is not only that history itself is being distorted, we scientists are more concerned about the fact that history of science is being distorted. So the whole new education policy has the agenda, this agenda. And I would not speak much, I will just stop here so that we can have more time for the question answers. But I would like everybody to ponder about this, that this is something the student community, teacher community, and everybody should not allow to happen. We must visit this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sabitra Banerjee. So, uh, I mean, we have uh, listened to all the four panelists by now, and uh, it's uh, time for it's time for initiating the discussion. So, I, I invite all the panelists to uh, come to the uh, chairs. Any format for the questions, but I think we can uh, experiment and 
uh, maybe who, who uh, 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 yeah, I mean, after the individual uh, presentations for the panelists, we did not have any uh, chance for uh, discussion. So those who have, uh, must have would have already have uh, questions or comments uh, would start presenting them, and then uh, the judges uh, will uh, regulate the discussion as it goes rather than uh, having brief of it. So uh, I, I invite uh, the audience to have come up with their questions. Yeah. Yeah. May I speak in Hindi? 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 सर जो एजुकेशन पॉलिसी पॉलिसी में आप लोगों ने जो चेंजेस के बारे में बताया है जो चेंजेस हो रहा है एजुकेशन पॉलिसी में आपने खुद भी डिस्कस हुआ सभी पैनलिस्ट ने प्रॉब्लम के बारे में बताया कि जो गवर्नमेंट ने पॉलिसी बना रही है वो चेंज हो रहा है उसका सॉल्यूशन क्या है मैं ये जानना चाहता हूँ I don't think uh, 
what you need is a new escape to a new policy, which will happen only if this government goes, as far as I can see. Because uh, there are, uh, no, look at the composition of that commission. There are no teachers except one, and maybe Manjul Bhargava counts as a teacher. But apart from Manjul Bhargava, there is one other teacher apparently from uh, SNP University. But there are no other teachers on that commission. And they want to make uh, education policy. It just, just doesn't make sense. And, the, and, and there's an emphasis on Sanskrit, which is clear. It's, uh, it's catering to the Hindu philosophy of the present government. There's not, nothing more. And I don't see why you do not teach it. Right. <clears throat> um, what, I, what I think is, is uh, we should be, especially primary education, a very good quality primary education is very important in our country. I'll give an example. Uh, why it's important is, I'll tell you, in Andhra Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, in and around Hyderabad, most of the rural areas, girls who are around 20 years, 20, 21, 22, who are married, who are having two children, they have been promoted to uh, go for hysterectomy in order to uterus. The argument from the doctor's side and the promoter, promoter's side is, you are young, you already have two children, and every month you will have menstruation. What for? There is no need to have uterus now. You have two children. So remove the uterus. Government is giving you RFG uh, program. In the uterus is removed for free of cost and there is no problem. So uterus is removed like that. But uterus is a part of the woman's body. It need not be removed at all. Ovaries and uterus are part, like appendix. Appendix is a part of the human body. Everybody will go to the operation theater and remove my appendix. That's not the way to look at the issue. But the question is, the issue here is, Ability to ask questions to the doctors or to the promoters of this program without any fear. That questioning ability is not there. It should come from children, from within, from family. So the, primary, the quality of primary education, secondary education. See, if you look at new education policy document, they enunciate very clearly. There should not be rota learning. There should be scientific temper, opportunities for all, highest quality of education. But where is the implementation? So what I understand from, I'm not an educationist, sir, I'm, I'm an uh, ordinary human being like uh, you. So there has to be a primary education of highest quality and the primary healthcare of highest quality. It is possible, like for example, it is possible from the government side. For the last 20, 25 years, we have got Navodaya Vidyalaya. Every district, one Navodaya Vidyalaya which is run by Ministry of HRD, Human Resource Development. One of the finest schools run by government, not by private, government school. For the last 20, 25 years, it is Prime Minister Pingvi Narasimhara, when he was HRD Minister, he started this program. And similarly, you have signing schools. Every state, one signing school run by government. Highest standard. See, government wants, it can run. It's not difficult. Our own state of Kerala has got 100% literacy. If we want, we can have it. If you look at health indicators, infant mortality rate, maternal mortality, and uh, you know, under five mortality rate, the rates of Kerala are comparable to any developed country in the world. It is a state, it is not one individual. Kerala state. That means if you want to implement a good quality primary education, a good quality primary health care, government can do it. Thank you. because you talked about quality of education. And for the quality of education to improve, the most important thing is that we need to have good teachers in the system. Unfortunately, this is not the case now. We don't have enough good teachers. And the only way you can get good teachers is to make the teaching profession attractive. It should have better environment than what it has. It should have better working conditions than what it has. You know, in an earlier era, the teacher used to be a respected member of the society. I don't think it's any longer true. School teacher is not particularly respected, in, at least in the urban areas. Maybe in rural areas there is still some respect, but urban areas it's not happening. And unless that happens, it's not going to work. And for that, you have to make the status of the school teacher 
far superior to what it is now. I don't know how it can be done. It will, of course, involve a lot of money because the, the government is the one which has to do this, but it's going to involve a lot of money. But I don't know whether the government is willing to spend that kind of money. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. My question is about the uh, development of scientific efforts. It's a fundamental duty in our constitution. Uh, but I, uh, it has been apparently codified in the national legislation policy. But I do not see, even in the past 30, 40 years, any government has promoted it. My example is homeopathy. Homeopathy, if there is one unscientific system of education, of medicine, that is homeopathy. That has been, that's not even Indian, so we don't even have that entity. At the same time, government runs medical colleges of, uh, on homeopathy. So, is it just that the national education policy is kind of codifying what is uh, attitude in our society, or is it actually the, uh, one of the first to talk about uh, uh, like the lack of scientific? I could that they have not introduced Yudani. Yudani is part of that. There is an Irish ministry. Yudani is part of that. You come from Yudani. Irish ministry. You come from Yudani. Ministry of Irish, no? Ayurveda, Yudani, Homeopathy, and Indian systems of education. So that's propagating lack of scientific temper for 30 40 years. I hope there are no homeopathy. There will be no homeopathy here also. If you look at the statistics, there is no homeopathy here. No, no, I have I had colleagues in that country who were strong homeopathy supporters. Yeah, I think a, a number of people have mentioned about uh, scientific temper, and I, I think this is really the crux of the problem. And some of the problem lies with with us teachers also, the way we have been teaching science and, and the way textbooks have been written also. It really does make science appear to be a collection of facts that have to be memorized. And that knowledge, uh, you know, science is just knowledge which is fixed and, uh, you know, it just, it's not even known where it comes from. Someone just declares this is the truth, and if that is someone who is a believable, you know, a, a, a professor or, a, or someone with political power, we just believe it. You know, if someone gives an anecdote that, oh, I took this uh, pill and, and my illness was cured, well, you believe it. So the problem is really, we don't have the scientific temper to know how to do science in our own lives, how to, how to question things. Or, or which questions are important, which, you know, that, that authority needs to be questioned, and that, you know, we need to look for evidence. So I, I think this is the only hope, really, in somehow to, to get across, really, that what is the essence of science is, is questioning and investigating, uh, that somehow we need to get to that in education. I do not have much to say on this. I only remember that when the corona struck, one company brought out a specific medicine called Korodi, which was approved by the Ayush. Yeah, so this speaks of the status of our scientific temper of the people who decide. Obviously, if um, this people are not given an idea about how a drug, if you decide that a drug is effective, then people can believe anything. As she's just saying that if, if somebody says that, okay, this, this guy has a uh, pain there, I administered this and it got cured, this is not a test at all. This is something we have to tell people, but telling people has to go through the education system. It's not that I tell somebody, but the education system educates the next generation about how to distinguish between truth and falsehood. This is something that is missing. So, I'd like to thank you.
The question I'd like to ask is how, in what directions you see this new education policy feeding into larger political processes, what is the motivation behind changing old existing uh, education policies in the direction in which they have been changed and what is the dynamic that is expected to be generated which will be of benefit to the present political dispensation. Answers may be obvious, but uh, I would like to have some answers. Uh, essentially, you know, if somebody has done a differential study of the older education policy, which has been supplanted with a newer one, in, so if there are directions and arrows which can be uh, kind of uh, pointed to, then that would help uh, carry forward another line of thinking. Uh, it's a very difficult question, but whatever I understand, I'd like to answer here. It's a clear example. See, we had uh, earlier Indian Medical Council for allopathy, which was the regulatory body of medical education and medical practices and medical colleges in India. 2020, there was National Medical Education Act and Bill. Bill and Act was passed. Now, uh, Indian Medical Council is abolished and National Medical Education, National Medical Commission, NMC, is formed. In that, almost 60 to 70 percent of the members are nominated by government and 20 to 25 percent of the members are elected, doctors will elect them. The latest news is, under NMC, the emblem was of our, uh, you know, Sriha, Lion's emblem. That is removed and Dhanvantri, Lord Dhanvantri's picture was, you know, placed instead of our national emblem. So Lord Dhanvantri is a god, a Hindu god, nothing to do with Hindu god. But you can be Muslim, you can be Christian, you can be Hindu or anybody. So this National Medical Commission emblem has to be about the nation, not about one community or one god. Clear? Just because, you know, just because some, uh, the, the powers that be can do whatever they would like to do, it's not acceptable. So we have to have some sort of democratic ways to express our protest. Indian Medical Association president has already expressed it. So it leads to, it's, it leads to our future generation. You know, when the constitution says, it doesn't say, uh, I, I, I Christian, you Muslim, I am Hindu. No, it says, we the people of India, we the people of America. It doesn't say the Christian, Hindu, Muslim. So National Medical Commission has to be, uh, it's a state. It's not about one religion. So we are going in a different direction. When we say, as Sir has said earlier, Indian, Indian knowledge system means, what is Indian knowledge system? It has to be questioned, it has to be clarified. I met one of the secretaries to the government of India and uh, she was talking about, the secretary was talking about uh, a national education policy of 1954, which was a completely research-based education policy. Okay, they have just went on. See, education policy has to be based on absolute research at the ground level. There are different uh, you know, stakeholders like teachers, students, community, Everybody has to be interviewed based on structured data, structured interview schedules. That was done for national health, our health, Dr. Sir Joseph Gore's report of 1944-46, which is called a health report. That report is a classic document where health policy can be developed. That report said in 1946, when it was uh, pronounced, this report says every primary health center in the rural area has to have 75 beds. Primary health center, which caters to 20,000 population in rural areas, which was pronounced in 1946, that was also Gore's report. Even today, we have hardly one bed or two beds in a primary health center. And above that, community health center, which caters to one lakh population. It said there will be 250 beds in a community health center. But we don't even have 30 beds now, maximum 50 beds after 75 years. Am I clear? But if, what I'm trying to say, again I'll come back to the same thing, if the government wants, they can do it. And they have done it. 
Let's take one example. I'll give another example. Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute of Medical Education and Research with the Kani Ampar. This one, I'll just pick one, one case and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute of Medical Education and Research in Trivandrum, one of the tertiary care cardiology, cardiac surgery and neurology institutions in India. They have one policy. The policy says a patient can come to the institute only on referral. Referral means you are a doctor, it can be allopathy, homeopathy. If you are referred to the patient, give me clinical notes, I am referring to the cardiologist, they see. If, if you don't get a reference letter, they will tell you to go to the neighboring prevent the medical college casualty. The reason is, if everybody with soft cold fever, if it's heart attack, major accident, if they go to medical college, medical college casualty is little overcrowded. Whereas secondary care hospitals, primary care centers are not at all overcrowded. They are just not, they don't have patients at all. So the policy if you want to test, all in the of medical sciences, you see lots and lots of patients in casualty. People are just Delhi, premier institution. People are just staying on the you know roadside, inside the campus, outside the they come from all over India. So if you want to develop a primary education, primary health care, a good quality of education, this scientific campus sir, government can do it. Thank you for, uh, the, thanks to the panelists for various comments. Now, uh, a lot of people who have, who, uh, from uh, being in the business, I mean, in, in discussion for uh, quite a while, have participated. I would uh, like to see if some of the younger people have uh, any questions to uh, take. I think it would be more important to get a sense of uh, what, what the younger audience is saying. Yes, please. faculty at this college itself and uh, coming from studying under Mumbai University and I feel I've had an all-round education because I've had all the subjects, all the papers, all in all semesters. But this NEP that we are implementing in our college or any of the other colleges, I feel that the students who um, say are specializing in life science, I'm from the life science department, are having to choose all these vocational skill courses and all of these additional courses that they have. Not all students are getting the chance to choose subject specific vocational skill courses or something. So they are not getting an all round education in the subject they want to major. So sir, how does NEP trying to justify that they are getting an all round education in the subject that they want to major? That's more like a comment, I think, which uh, uh, the audience can uh, ponder over. I don't think uh, there's any specific thing to say about that. It, it's, it's more of uh, how things are unfolding rather than uh, something that necessarily is embedded. So, uh, may, I mean, this uh, uh, kind of difficulty or lacuna in shooting can be brought out and uh, they, they are perhaps the easier ones that may be dealt with, but uh, I, 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 I think about uh, the choices being actually implemented, etc. Et and uh, hopefully that part will be smoothed out. But I, I think there is uh, more uh, to worry about, more in the direction of what the, uh, as uh, Professor Banerjee put it, put in some way, that uh, what is it that we are passing on to the next generation and where uh, the, uh, the, the basic crucial idea of conveying that we should make our decisions based on scientific paper in a certain way that is based on rationale and logic rather than uh, somebody's uh, private preferences that, that's which is what we see happening in, in various things so various defects so and I hope that uh, I mean, much of the, uh, the, the, the some of the discussion that we had here would somehow impact the uh, uh, outside in some some in school way at least, and uh, will proceed in the uh, proper direction. So with this, uh, I think I'll declare the final discussion closed. And then, uh,